Welcome everyone. Good evening. I am Hazel. I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy and the convener of this seminar series. And tonight's is a special event slotted into our program because of the events in the Ukraine. Tonight's speaker is Sir Roger Glein, who was a British diplomat for 34 years and spent half his total career dealing with the Soviet Union and its successor states, and ending as British ambassador to Moscow. Uh, and since then, he's visited Russia regularly as a businessman, consultant, and commentator. And you may well have heard him on the radio in recent weeks, commenting on the events in the Ukraine. So we have no better speaker to talk about the Ukrainian crisis, and to address tonight's question, is Russia trying to revive the Soviet Union. Roderick, you're immensely welcome. Thank you. The last few weeks have been very good for the dying industry of Kremlinology, and some very old war horses like me have been wheeled out. Suddenly people are interested in this subject again. It may not last very long. Um, if any of you hail from Russia or Ukraine, uh, I apologize if I say things that you regard as grossly biased or grossly inaccurate and please attack me vigorously in the question time. I do not claim, obviously, to know more about your countries than you do. Uh, and I would like to start, while my overall title is, Is Russia Trying to Revive the Soviet Union? Um, start simply by asking the question, what is Ukraine? Because I think that has to be the starting point uh, for this conversation. Um, Crimea and Ukraine are now constitutionally and, well, physically, de facto, if not de jure, separate. So when I talk about Ukraine, I am effectively talking about Ukraine minus Crimea, which doesn't mean that I recognize in legal terms what Russia has recently done by annexing Crimea. Crimea, of course, was originally settled by Tatars. Uh, then there was a Russian influx. It now amounts to about 2.4 million people. That's including Sevastopol, which administratively is a separate district. And of those, 58% in the last census uh, were ethnic Russian, 24% called themselves Ukrainian, and 12% Tatar. The Tatar bit is important. You will have read a lot about the Tatars of late, I suspect, and how they uh, were allowed to drift back to Crimea, having been deported by Stalin. Uh, although, of all the peoples deported by Stalin during the Second World War, they're the only one that was never officially rehabilitated. Uh, the 300,000 Tatars in Crimea, uh, essentially Muslim, uh, are going to be a thorn in Russian flesh in the years ahead. Uh, they didn't want to move, and there are quite a lot of them. But let's talk about the rest of Ukraine. Essentially, in the last few weeks, we've been given uh, through the media and through the voices of uh, people in Kiev and Moscow two different narratives about Ukraine, uh, neither of which is wholly true. One is that Ukraine is the revival of a historic state. There's never actually been a state of Ukraine uh, within its current borders before 1991. Kievan Rus, the original, uh, if not state, country uh, centuries ago, was overrun by the Mongols in 1240. And since then, the lands which became Ukraine have been overrun by Russians, Tatars, uh, Turks, Cossacks, Poles, Swedes, Germans, you name it. They were reunited or united for a certain period from 1569 to 1648, but actually under Polish sovereignty. They then transferred themselves from the Poles to the Russians, uh, and Peter the Great and then Catherine the Great incorporated uh, those lands of Ukraine into the growing Russian Empire. And then between the First and the Second World War, uh, in the last century, Western Ukraine uh, was part of Poland, and Eastern Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. So there is no clearly defined historic state of Ukraine. 
The second point that one tends to hear from some in Moscow is that Ukraine is essentially divided between Ukrainians in the West and Russians in the East, in, in territories, not only Crimea, uh, that have ended up within the boundaries of the modern Ukrainian state, but in the view of uh, many in Russia, should never have been there. That's a dangerous oversimplification. Only about a third of Ukrainians speak Russian as their first language. Only about 17% in the last census identified themselves as ethnic Russians. And of that 17%, uh, the evidence suggests that a fairly small number, uh, one is guessing at this point, but maybe a third of them, uh, would prefer to be ruled by Moscow rather than by Kiev. As for the rest of Ukraine, you have huge intermarriage, not only between so-called Russians and so-called Ukrainians, but indeed other nationalities from the former Soviet Union. And the end result is that most Ukrainians speak both languages, and the desire to remain independent of Russia has been the strongest feature perceptible over the last 20 years, binding them together. Many of them, I think most of them, wish to have an extremely friendly relationship with Russia, have Russian relatives, Russian friends, trade with Russia, and certainly see no future being separated from Russia. But they draw a distinction between that and being ruled by Moscow and taken in the sort of direction in which Russia is heading at the moment. Let me know, now just try to identify the the origins of the crisis that is now happening. Its roots essentially lie in the collapse of the Soviet Union. A collapse, above all, that was caused not by President Reagan, but by the collapse of the Soviet economy. Uh, a point that Mr. Putin, I think, needs to bear in mind as he looks ahead. Now, that was a political earthquake uh, to which we tend to attach the prefix geo as in geostrategic or geopolitical. And it left a lot of fault lines, and through these fault lines have come a whole series of aftershocks, of which the current crisis is neither the first nor will it be the last. Now, the end of the Warsaw Pact, the liberation of Poland and Czechoslovakia as it then was, and East Germany and Hungary and so on, Romania, Bulgaria, was a managed process. It was managed, it was to a degree negotiated in 1989 and 1990. There was a very important east-west negotiation, the so-called two plus four process, that essentially managed the exit of Soviet forces and the Soviet Union from East Germany and prepared for the reunification of Germany. But the collapse of the Soviet Union itself was not a managed process, it was a very sudden and indeed until fairly late in the day, unpredicted process. Uh, we had the coup against Gorbachev of the 18th of August 1990, then quickly reversed in a counter coup uh, led by uh, President Yeltsin, at the time the president of the Russian Federation, who restored Gorbachev to the leadership of the USSR, but did not wish to surrender all the power back to Gorbachev. Yeltsin uh, then used, exploited his base in the Russian Federation and the growing independence movement in Ukraine in order to demolish the Soviet Union, which was his way of unseating Gorbachev. So on the 1st of December 1991, Ukraine voted in a referendum by 90% for independence, quite probably an accurate figure, that 90% and Kravchuk was elected president. Uh, five days later, in a hunting lodge in Belarus, Kravchuk, Yeltsin, and the president of Belarus, Shushkevich, met, agreed to form the Commonwealth of Independent States, originally of those three states, but with others uh, then uh, fairly rapidly joining in. Now, their conception at the time was that the CIS would uh, have a common military strategic space, a unified military command, all the nuclear weapons under one command, uh, a common currency, the ruble, essentially a common economy. Uh, this led, as we know, on the 25th of December 1991 to the 
definitive end of the Soviet Union, its replacement by the Commonwealth of Independent States, by Russia as the successor state in international legal terms, taking responsibility for the seat in the UN Security Council, for the debts of the Soviet Union, uh, but in theory and in law, on an equal basis with the 14 other states, actually the Baltic states had already by then departed, but the other uh, 14 states of the former Soviet Union. Now the problem was that the concept of the Commonwealth of Independent States simply didn't work. Uh, it proved to be a rather fragile structure and very quickly the constituent states started to go their own way. The Russians were left as this happened and of course they were in a very weak state, their economy collapsed in 1992, their inflation rate reached an annual rate of 2,400% if we can conceive of that. That was the, the measure of the total collapse of the Russian economy. So in this state of weakness, they watched their, their, their sister states uh, essentially defining their own futures for themselves, uh, not at the behest of Moscow or through negotiation with Moscow. And the CIS became an empty vessel. This left a lot of the, uh, the political class in Russia, a lot of people in Russia, with a deep sense of uh, resentment, resentment at Yeltsin for breaking the Soviet Union up, resentment also at the Ukrainians, uh, really a great difficulty in accepting Ukraine as a separate state, as a foreign country, because it had been so intertwined historically with Russia and in the days of Kiev and Rus, uh, when Moscow didn't exist, had really been the center of that Slavic people. Um, and the inclusion in Ukraine of Crimea and of these predominantly Russian-speaking uh, cities in the east, places in the Donbass and so on, places like Kharkov and uh, uh, Donetsk, uh, only added to the sense of loss and resentment. Even the advisers to President Yeltsin, although he had provoked this and caused it to happen, uh, still found this something that they couldn't swallow and thought in time should be reversed. And I think this is quite important. This is not just invented by Putin. Uh, one of Yeltsin's most senior foreign policy advisers uh, said to um, a Western ambassador uh, in November 1991, just before the Soviet Union actually dissolved, uh, the following. Russia may now be going through a bad time, but the reality is that in a decade or two decades, which takes us up precisely to where we are now, Russia will reassert itself as the dominant force in this huge geographical area. Meanwhile, Yeltsin will have no choice but to assert Russia's position if it is challenged. His entourage will see to that. So if the Ukrainians are too provocative over the Crimea, for instance, he will have to weigh in with force if necessary. That is in no one's interest. It's an interesting bit of prescience uh, on the part of the person concerned. So all of this means that the so-called settlement of 1991, the settlement that replaced not only the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, but essentially uh, meant the end of the uh, 1944 Yalta Agreement under which uh, the Americans and the British essentially recognized Stalin's control of uh, a large part of Eastern Europe. Uh, that ended. The settlement of 1991 was not planned, it wasn't prepared, it wasn't properly formalized, it wasn't really a settlement. And it was never really accepted by most of the Russian leadership who had been brought up in the Soviet Union, and indeed the current Russian leadership. Putin and his colleagues are all people still who were adults when the Soviet Union ended. Uh, that was their formation. This non-settlement, as I would call it, left masses of questions unresolved or open. The borders were not properly demarcated. The status of minorities, both the Russian minorities now finding themselves stranded in neighboring states in places like Latvia on the one hand or northern Kazakhstan where there's a very large Russian minority on the other, um, and the status of minorities from those countries now finding themselves uh, citizens of Russia uh, were essentially 
uh, not uh, in any way regulated or subjected to some form of agreement uh, and protection of their rights. The, the future of the inherited economic connections, and this was a totally interlinked economy, uh, was not thought through um, and therefore some of these connections remained, some fractured over time, again in an unmanaged way. The defence arrangements had not been thought through because they were going to be covered within the Commonwealth of Independent States and so the security perimeter of Russia remained that what had been the security perimeter of the Soviet Union and the Russian military still tend to think in those terms so that as far as they're concerned psychologically they have a security perimeter which includes the Baltic states which are now members of NATO uh, but in which NATO doesn't station large or threatening forces. Um, all of the relationships between these new states and indeed their outward uh, orientation were open questions. Essentially these were all fault lines and on these fault lines the earthquake continued to erupt and the result was a series of conflicts, tensions and aftershocks. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan which has led to one, it is now a frozen conflict. The uh, essentially continuing conflict uh, now for 15 years, 20 years really, in the North Caucasus, not only Chechnya but uh, Dagestan and other uh, territories in the North Caucasus, deeply unstable. Uh, more recently in 2008 the conflict over Georgia which led to uh, essentially two frozen conflicts over South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, two mini territories claiming independence but not recognised by anybody serious other than Russia. The division of Moldova uh, into Moldova, the recognised state, and Transnistria, the breakaway uh, republic dominated by ethnic Russians and still essentially uh, garrisoned by forces who consider themselves to be Russian. The fragile state of Belarus, which is, uh, well, I think when Lukashenko uh, disappears as president is going to come into play and is another potential source of, of conflict and of major disagreement between East and West. And most importantly of all, in the midst of all of this, Ukraine. So what then are the main drivers of the crisis that we are now facing in March of this year? Um, we have to bear in mind that while, in a sense for people in the West, this is a crisis of choice, we didn't actually have to get involved. We could have taken the traditional attitude as we did in Czechoslovakia in 1938, uh, that this is a faraway country of which we know little. and We haven't got a dog in that fight. Let them sort it out between themselves and the Russians and within Ukraine. But for Russia, this was not a crisis of choice. For Russia, with the perspective of the certainly Russian leadership, but a lot of the Russian population. This is an existential question. Russia without Ukraine ceases to be a great country. Uh, it is a much smaller object. And Russia and Russians have been brought up through their history on the idea of greatness. It still has great power with Russians. It was something that Putin certainly appealed to in his speech in the Kremlin a week ago. I'd like to just turn a little bit to that speech. First of all, to the, the setting of his speech. I mean, I, I watched it on television, I talked afterwards to people who were in the hall. It was an enormously powerful bit of rhetoric. Various Western commentators have deconstructed his lies, and of course it was deeply mendacious, but it was also very cleverly put together, and it pushed a lot of buttons. First thing he did was he chose not to go and make his speech in the Parliament, though he was predominantly addressing an audience of the two Houses of Parliament, he of course did it in the most imperial part of the Grand Kremlin Palace, in the St. George's Hall, which had been uh, rebuilt by Yeltsin at unbelievable expense in the 1990s, at a time when Russia was utterly bankrupt. In, in Soviet days, they had sort of plain wooden benches in there, and the uh, Supreme Soviet uh, met in that hall. It's a massive hall. Uh, Yeltsin had it covered in gilt from floor to ceiling. Tons of gold were painted onto the wall of that hall, and then Tsarist emblems and Tsarist crests 
uh, were, 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 were placed around the walls. Um, its grandeur makes the Royal Gallery in the House of Lords or the throne room in Buckingham Palace look rather like the living room of a suburban semi-detached house. It has enormous power as a room. And in this setting, Putin wrapped himself, not just in the Russian flag, but in this selective and very emotive reading of Russian history. Not Soviet history. Indeed, he rather disparaged Soviet history and the Bolsheviks for giving away Crimea. Uh, but Russian history. And in a very, very effective way, and he can connect with his people when he's on good form, and he was, uh, he stirred the pride and the patriotic fervour of his audience, not only in the hall, but right across the country through television. And a very liberal friend of mine, who happened to be in that room at the time in the audience, said that even he could feel his emotions rising. And certainly watching them, everybody was gripped by this performance. Then you look at what Putin actually said, and I'll just pick out a few key phrases. Crimea symbolised Russia's military glory, the history of Crimea. It was only when Crimea ended up as part of a different country that Russia realised it was not simply robbed, it was plundered. This is playing into the sense of victimhood, the sense of national humiliation as to what happened with the end of the Soviet Union uh, very strongly. In 1991, Russia humbly accepted the situation, incapable of protecting its own interests. This was an outrageous historical injustice, again pushing the victimhood uh, button. Then on the Ukrainians. Time and again, attempts were made to deprive Russians, he means Russians in Ukraine, of their historical memory, even of their language, and to subject them to forced assimilation. On the Ukrainian regime, nationalists, neo-Nazis, Russophobes and anti-Semites executed this coup. Now, <clears throat> there are people in the interim government who up to a point justify that description. We have to face up to the fact that Svoboda, a far-right nationalist party, which was condemned by the European Parliament in a resolution of 2012 for being racist and, and, and uh, obnoxious in a series of ways listed in the resolution, now has 38 seats in the, in the Ukrainian Parliament, in the Rada, but most significantly it is sitting on four ministerial chairs, including the Security Council, uh, in the interim government. Uh, and unfortunately, they are now to a degree, the bedfellows of the European Union. Putin, of course, is hyping this up. Then the West. Western partners have come to believe in their exclusivity and exceptionalism. I'll come back to this in a minute. They have lied to us many times, made decisions behind our backs, placed us before an accomplished fact. Then he went on about NATO enlargement, missile defence, and now the threat of sanctions. Again, this is we are the defenders, we are the victims, the West is seeking to undermine and encircle us. And then most interestingly and strikingly, the infamous policy of containment led in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries continues today. They are constantly trying to sweep us into a corner and with Ukraine our Western partners have crossed the line. Now, containment to students of modern history was essentially a policy um, of which George Kennan tends to be regarded as the godfather uh, that was pursued in the Cold War after the Second World War. Uh, I've not heard before this projected back into the 18th and 19th centuries. So it's a rewriting of history in order to create this atmosphere of constant attempts to encircle and contain Russia, prevent Russia from enjoying its rights, by implication, its rights to expand. And finally, are we ready to consistently defend our national interests or will we forever give in, retreat to who knows when? This, I'm standing here, I can't move back. One of the things Putin did in this speech was to box himself in, to actually deprive himself of um, 
a lot of room for manoeuvre because he has now stirred up nationalist feelings to the point where any concessions by him, uh, were he to think of making any, would risk being seen as retreat, as humiliation, and could indeed become uh, dangerous to his own position. So this is a narrative of humiliation, of exploitation by the West of Russia's weakness in the 1990s, of victimization, and also an awful lot, which I haven't quoted, about Western double standards, about Kosovo, about ignoring international law over Iraq and Afghanistan and whenever it suited the West, and so on. Um, let me just quote a little further from somebody who is, I think, not a huge admirer of President Putin, somebody who is not of that generation, a, a, a man of, I should think, late 30s or 40s, a highly intelligent man who edits the uh, Russian journal, not a bad journal, on, on, on foreign affairs, Fyodor Lukyanov, from, from one of his most recent articles. In Russia, there has always been a perception that the USSR did not just lose, but surrendered and left the battlefield. He talked of Russia's status as a beaten power led not only to the need to make concessions again and again, but also meant that the rights she wanted could never be reinstated in the new system. The right to discuss universal human values and the rules of international relations went to the winning side. Now the point he's making there is that in 1990, Russia thought it would continue to be treated as a great power, instead of which Russia was told it would just have to accept the acquis, rather like the uh, United Kingdom joining the European Union late, and have to play by the rules of the clubs that it was joining. Russia wanted to have the right to renegotiate the rules. Russia had been a partner in the negotiation of the founding of the United Nations. Russia, of course, had helped to negotiate rules at Yalta, but now it was being treated as a defeated power. And this played into a lot of historical insecurity. This is a country that has been invaded over and over again in its history, whether by Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, and then opposed by NATO, and then in the period in which, as far as we're concerned, NATO is in no sense threatening Russia, and NATO was always a defensive um, uh, alliance, Russia has seen NATO's membership expand, the Baltic states, Poland, right down to Romania coming into NATO, and this conjures up this vision of uh, encirclement and containment. Uh, <clears throat> let me now turn to the Western perspective on this. Our perspective is, in a sense, the mirror image. In the 1990s, we didn't think we were humiliating Russia. We went to enormous lengths to try to actually help Russia and the other former Soviet states, a lot of economic support, uh, a lot of moves to build political partnership, to create a Russia-NATO council. The European Union started talking about building a genuine strategic partnership with Russia. We thought we were saying, come on in. We actually wanted, because we thought it would be good for us as well as good for Russia, very much in our interests, we wanted Russia to join the ranks of the advanced, prosperous, market-oriented democracies. And so Russia did join a whole series of international organizations and ultimately, uh, in the first part of the last decade, uh, became a full member of the G8, now suspended. Part of the deal from the Western point of view was that we were accepting Russia as the successor state, as I said earlier, to the Soviet Union, uh, therefore continuing in the UN Security Council permanent membership that had been the Soviet Union without having to reapply, no renegotiation of that. But in our conception, successor state did not mean dominant state. We expected that Russia would respect the sovereignty and the freedom of choice of the other 14. The famous Budapest Memorandum, much quoted of late, under which Russia, uh, Ukraine gave up its, its nuclear weapons, uh, reaffirmed that. We were never remotely willing uh, to contemplate another Yalta. In all of this, I think we failed to appreciate the Russian point of view sufficiently. Uh, essentially, we were and we are now uh, holding on to two irreconcilable points of view over 
the former Soviet territories that lie between Russia and the European Union, uh, Ukraine, of course, the largest of them. Um, we underestimated the time that it takes a nation to change its mentality. We shouldn't have done. We should have looked at ourselves in this country and asked how long it took the British to get used to the idea that we were no longer a great power and no longer an empire. Some would say we still haven't got used to it. But certainly, you would say this kept us out of the European Union when it was founded. It probably took two generations. And you can look at many other examples in history and you come to the same conclusion. It takes two or three generations for this sort of deeply embedded mentality to adjust itself to new facts that are highly unpalatable and particularly to a loss of power. We did not really appreciate that Ukraine was absolutely the highest priority in Russia's external policy. We actually believe that building up relations with the West, surely, rationally, was much more important for them. Well, rationally, you could argue it should have been, but it wasn't, for the reasons I've already given. When we ended up taking military action in 1999, under the NATO flag, the first time that NATO had ever actually dropped a bomb in anger against Yugoslavia, we did so for reasons that had no relation to Russia, but this was perceived in Moscow and not properly appreciated in Western capitals as an action against Russia. Russia had been excluded from the discussion over Yugoslavia as it was over Kosovo at the later stage, the recognition of Kosovo. This was seen very much as an anti-Russian move by NATO. Uh, we thought they were just making a bit of a fuss. Then, I think a huge mistake made on the Western side uh, not universally, blame for this not universally shared, largely rests with neocon elements in the Bush administration, was to try to push Georgia and Ukraine in 2007, 2008 towards membership of NATO via a membership action plan. That was crossing a Russian red line. That coming uh, three years after the Orange Revolution really cemented in Putin's head the idea that actually the West was out uh, to take away Russia's historic uh, influence and therefore to undermine him. And I think his hostility to the West really stems from the Orange Revolution, so nine years ago, but I think this NATO decision was crass in the extreme. Uh, the Ukrainians never had a majority of people wanting to join NATO, uh, and yet it was pushed forward uh, and it ended in tears with the unbelievably stupid outcome of the NATO Bucharest summit in 2008, April, in which NATO actually said, well, we're not giving you the map, but someday in the future we will um, envisage you, the door will be open to you joining NATO. So we ended up with the worst of both worlds, and no big surprise that in August of that year, uh, Russian troops were invading Georgia. We essentially threw a match into that tinderbox. So irreconcilable differences over the post-Soviet space have been absolutely at the core of Russia's deteriorating political relations with the West for over a decade. Uh, I think a third uh, important trigger for the crisis has simply been the failure over two decades of Ukraine. The gross mismanagement of that country, whoever has been in power, whether it's been Yushchenko, Kravchuk, Kuchma, Yanukovych, they've all mismanaged it, they've allowed corruption to flourish, they've allowed oligarchs to control an enormous amount of the economy. Uh, they have made a total mess of the governance and the economic management of the country. So, in a sense, it has become a constant battleground, and it was vulnerable. I mean, it is now in a very fragile state, so there's almost an invitation uh, to uh, Russia next door to say, right, now is the time to press on that vulnerability. Uh, final trigger for me, and a point we should never forget, is Putin's personal agenda. This drives a lot of his decisions. Putin is not a strategist. Putin is a, a survivor and a judo player. And he and his group have one strategy above all others, which is not really a strategy, but one strategic objective. It is to remain in power. It is to remain in power because they have left themselves with no alternative. Unlike the Chinese, they have no succession mechanism. Putin could not trust somebody else to take power and not get their own back at him. It would be a very dangerous situation for him. So 
They need to retain control of the power. They are the only institution in Russia and uh, of the huge amounts of the economy that they have brought into their hands, sometimes in state uh, corporations such as Gazprom, sometimes in uh, corporations that are partly privately owned. Putin's ratings in December of last year were not low, but they were at their lowest point ever. He has been in decline, his popularity, uh, not steeply, but incrementally over the last two or three years. His deal with Medvedev to resume the presidency was very unpopular, was seen as very shabby. Uh, and above all, the economy is doing incredibly badly as a result of his mismanagement of Russia. The econ Russian economy should be growing at a trend rate of about 4 to 5 uh, percent a year. Last year it grew at 1.3 percent. This year, before the crisis, it was projected to grow at 1 percent. It probably will tip into recession as a result of this crisis. Uh, uh, real wages are flat. Living standards are no longer giving up. They're nowhere near a tipping point. But the potential riches of Russia have been sequestered and wasted and the economy has not developed except in the number of slogans thrown around about innovation, modernization, diversification, none of which have happened. And they haven't happened because economic restructuring and reform stopped in Russia. It's not just economic, it's political that is needed. Uh, pretty abruptly when the oil price went through $35 a barrel in 2003. Um, and they are now paying the price for that. That is Putin's point of vulnerability. So then you get to what caused this, the immediate trigger, which was, of course, the EU getting into an arm wrestle with Russia over whether they signed up with the Eurasian Union or the European Union. And I asked myself, did the European Union think that through? Did they appreciate what they were getting into at this point? Because uh, this for Putin was a zero-sum question. This was going to be a trigger for, for trouble, as it has been. The EU is now in the position of holding a fair amount of responsibility for trying to prop up Ukraine and turn it around and make it into a functioning state. And this is not Kosovo. I mean, this is 40 million people. This is a huge country that for two decades has been the worst performing economy in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. It's a task that needs not only gigantic amounts of money. Uh, Putin will know that in those areas, Russian forces would not be welcomed as liberators. Uh, he might split Ukraine, but he would take on the burden of running this place, and particularly of running regions of Ukraine where there's a lot of old heavy industry, very dependent on subsidy from Kiev. Uh, does he really want that? It wouldn't be sustainable over time and then Russia would face major sanctions and I think pretty total isolation uh, around the world. And Putin will remember also the fate of Nikita Khrushchev, who took a risk too far in the Cuban crisis and was sacked by the Politburo for being an adventurist. And he's not a man, by and large, attuned to taking big risks. Surely it is a much better policy for him to continue to destabilize the interim government to bring maximum pressure on Ukraine by squeezing the economy, by having the threat of military incursion without the actuality, by bombarding the place with propaganda, and a lot of people in eastern Ukraine watch Russian television, uh, by fermenting certain amounts of agitation. Uh, keep it weak, and then sit back and watch and see how well the European Union does in putting the place on its feet. You have this fragile government, you still have the Maidan. The people in the Maidan Square in Kiev have not packed their tents and go gone away. They are like a sort of permanent second parliament exercising a power of veto over the interim government. And I was talking to one very well-informed and senior Ukrainian yesterday who was envisaging the possibility that the Maidan, who were getting a bit fed up with Yatsenyuk and the interim government, might actually toss them over even before the presidential elections happen on the 25th of May. I don't know what the probability of that is, but it does demonstrate the fragility of the whole situation. So Putin can sit back and wait for Ukraine to crumble. He's already set out Russia's terms for a settlement, that Ukraine should be neutral, which means not just not joining NATO, I think it also means that they would not sign any agreement with the European Union that excluded Russia. 
that anything they did with the European Union would to a degree be subject to a Russian veto. So that's point one. Secondly, that the Ukrainians form a government acceptable to Russia. They are refusing point blank to recognize the interim government even if Lavrov sat down with the foreign minister yesterday. And thirdly, they are demanding through a diktat, they have said the word must in this, that the Ukrainians must change their constitution and introduce a federal constitution which could indeed be a step to Ukraine splitting apart and doesn't seem to be necessarily desired by the people of Ukraine. So the people in Kiev have got the choice. Do they sue for peace now? And there have been some signals that they are sort of prepared to buy into some of the Russian conditions. Or do they continue to try to get to a presidential election, then re-elect a parliament, then stabilize the country, uh, withstand Russian pressure with help from the European Union, uh, get the country working properly. But with the risk that somewhere along that road it collapses in the shambles. Uh, your Western attention by then, our attention span is very small. It'll be on the inside pages, one paragraph. We'll have forgotten about it for most of this time. Uh, and they then have to go to Moscow and say, Mr. Putin, please will you save us? Because the West can't. So that's rather dismal. Uh, what about the longer term objective? Coming back to my title, is he trying to revive the Soviet Union? I don't believe he is. We all remember his famous remark that the collapse of the USSR was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. What people tend to forget is another Putin remark, which I think is uh, nearer to, 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 to the truth, which is that anyone who has a heart, by which he meant any Russian who has a heart, must regret the end of the Soviet Union. But anyone who has a head knows it cannot be put back together. He doesn't want to put it back together. He doesn't want Central Asia. He wants to dominate it, but not own it. He doesn't want the Transcaucasus. Uh, the same is true. Uh, in his speech, he talked about the common, the culture, civilization, and values that unite the peoples of. And at that point, he said, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, full stop. Forget the rest. Those are the bits that really count. So he has, optimally, two tracks <clears throat> over the long term. Get those three plus Kazakhstan into a Eurasian Union. Looks now as if what he has done has killed off that prospect for quite a long time to come. But if Ukraine collapses, he'd try it again. Um, and on the other track, maintain leverage over the other countries that he's not particularly interested in, essentially to exclude uh, alien powers, mostly meaning NATO, but increasingly over time in Central Asia, uh, meaning China. Uh, he doesn't want a place like Kazakhstan uh, becoming uh, too beholden to the Chinese. So either it's Fortress Russia or it's Fortress Eurasia, but with this vulnerability that Russia, Ukraine and Belarus are all desperately underperforming economies. And the risk to Mr. Putin personally, coming back to his personal agenda, is how long will the elite stand for this? when their interests really start to hurt, as some of them will be doing already, how long will the Russian populace be diverted from the declining economy by uh, these sorts of measures? How much internal repression and control will he have to apply uh, to maintain his control of the country? And then the long-term risk, which is a nightmare for uh, most Russians that I know and that I've ever discussed it with, which is that Russia becomes so weak that it has no alternative but to become the junior partner or even the satellite of China. There's been a lot of brave talk in the last few days in Moscow about, oh, well, if we can't get stuff from the West, we'll go and we'll work on the money markets of Hong Kong and we'll get Chinese investment in. There's no way that the Russians want uh, the Chinese to buy up the resources of Siberia. They've been resisting it for years. So uh, I come to the conclusion that the zero-sum approach that we have been sucked into, as well as, which is the approach that Russia has always had to Ukraine, um, has been a disaster for everybody. The Ukrainians have lost, they're in a bad shape. Russia has lost its one Crimea and essentially lost Ukraine. And we have lost because we are now responsible for trying to sort out Ukraine, which I fear 
is not a doable job. We could have reached a different sort of accommodation if we'd had different actors. We could all have agreed that the only sensible future for Ukraine is to have strong and open relations with Russia, strong and open relations uh, with its European Union neighbours, and it no, didn't have to make a choice between the two, but I'm afraid now it's going to be much more difficult. Thank you. Masterly analysis. And the project's kindly left us 40 minutes for questions. Um, I'll take them in groups. So, hands up. Yes, you, sir, and then coming to you, and then we'll come to the front. And remind us who you are. Yes. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, the name is Ewan Grant. I'm the former Customs and Excise Intelligence Analyst for transnational organized crime in the ex-Soviet Union, and I did work for several years in the EU border assistance mission to Moldova and Ukraine, based in Kiev. Uh, before my quick question, I would just say on the, I think Sir Roderick made a really crucial point in relation to this talk of Russia taking the south, southern corridor and effectively cutting Ukraine off from the Black Sea. Um, what he felt President Putin was to do um, fits in with that because he doesn't have to do that. As long as he's got Transnistria and the very deep state issues of Odessa, um, he's got an awful lot of influence on the economy. So my question is, um, Sir Roderick, um, do you think that it is possible that um, Brussels can do what you suggested in your um, Chatham House article a day or two back of a task force to help Ukraine led by somebody of the very highest political power and quality. Is that doable? I have to say, from my time in Ukraine, looking at Brussels, I'm very doubtful about that. Very doubtful indeed. Thank you. Hold that if you would, and we'll take one more in this round. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Pete Duncan from CIS. Um, uh, excellent analysis, um, but could I ask you to go further? Um, is it not the case that the Eastern Partnership, right from the start, was misconceived? In, uh, despite what was said in Brussels, in fact, it was encroaching on Russia's geopolitical interests, and it would be better if the EU in the future didn't try and play geopolitics. And linked with that, wouldn't it have been a good idea if the EU had responded positively when Yanukovych suggested that the EU and Russia get together with Ukraine to try and solve Ukraine's problems back last, uh, to, at the end of last year? And finally, Rod, if, uh, if um, can, I'll be right in any sense to attribute rationality to Putin. Is it not the case that uh, he's been acting irrationally in terms of the interest of the Russian state as opposed to the interest of his own coterie. But irrationally in relation to the Russian state, um, if we've seen what the damage that has already been done to the Russian economy, um, by in terms of the stock market, the flight of capital, by the annexation of Russia. And is he not really just reacting um, instinctively to events? Um, I think you might have implied this, uh, not having any strategy at all. Thank you. Can Brussels do a task force? Um, it could be done, and I think it would need the European <laughs> Union plus the United States plus heavily involved the international financial institutions. As I said, I think it's a 10-year job. I think it should be done, actually. I think we've got ourselves into a situation we, where we really ought to do it. But I'm afraid that there is very little chance of this happening. I share your doubts fully. Uh, I don't think there is sufficient coherence in Europe or between Europe and the United States to make this happen. Uh, I think that our attention span, as I said, is too short. I don't feel a great weight of public opinion behind it. I've been struck by the fact how many people in this country have said, uh, said to me or said on phone-ins or in the columns of newspapers, why are we actually bothering about Ukraine? I mean, what's it got to do with us? And Okay, it's fine for Russia to have Crimea. Uh, 
um, it's no big issue. I think you can assemble that kind of approach after some really major event, such as Second World War, when you know the Marshall Plan, that sort of stuff. And I'm afraid that to most of the electorate and the people who'd have to pay taxes for this, uh, this is not big enough. I mean, this is, I think, the most serious thing to have happened in East-West relations since the end of the Soviet Union. But I, I, so what I said in my article is this is what we should do. Having got into this situation, almost to demonstrate my fear that Europe is going to fail in this task, that we will end up humiliated. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. And that uh, essentially Ukraine will end up suing for peace from Moscow on President Putin's terms. I think we're too late to reconsider now. We've gone too far and we have to see whether the current yeast will work and remember that Putin himself is under pressure. He's wishing to maintain the opposite impression, of course, and it may be over time that the pressure on him will hit before the pressure on us of the crumbling situation in Ukraine. But really until Putin goes, it's hard to envisage a sort of rational negotiation about the future of Ukraine of the kind that should have happened. The other point I made in, 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 in that article, which I've made many times over, uh, is that we have needed for years and years a mechanism in Europe to deal with these aftershocks. What's happening now really should not surprise us, least of all after what happened in Georgia. And uh, in Cold War days, we had a lot of mechanisms for making sure that we didn't end up in a nuclear war with Russia. We actually had ways in which we talked to each other and managed the process. And that has been absent for the last 20 years. Russia does have some serious interests, as well as some perceptions that absolutely clash with ours. And we need to be sitting around a table, not in the middle of a crisis, um, looking at the horizon and saying, there's trouble brewing here. We are going to find ourselves in a deep argument and possibly in conflict over such and such there. What do we do about it? Start negotiating about it. Try to preempt it. If we fail to preempt it and it reaches a sort of level of crisis, have a mechanism for managing the crisis. Been a lot of telephone diplomacy recently, but that is not the same. So I think there's a big hole there. Uh, on Pete Duncan's uh, questions, um, the Eastern Partnership, I don't think, was sort of big enough and serious enough really to cross the Russian red lines. Uh, I don't put it in the same category as NATO enlargement, which Russia could live with Poland and Romania going into NATO. It was much more difficult, but they took it uh, when the Baltic states came in, but they needed quite a lot of reassurance that NATO wasn't going to put sharp, pointy stuff in the Baltic states. But no way ever could they tolerate Ukraine coming to NATO. And I'm not just saying that now, because when the archives were opened, correspondence that I sent from Moscow back to the British government in 2004, saying we would be completely barking mad to do this, because people were starting to talk about it then. Uh, and, and, and it's bonkers. It was bonkers. It was really stupid. I think the problem with Yanukovych's offer was it was too late. Yanukovych as an individual lacked credibility. Were we going to negotiate a deal that left him in power? Uh, we couldn't, because uh, he was corrupt. He was, as we later discovered, losing support of his own people in the party of the regions. And it would have meant buying into his agenda and Putin's agenda. I think it was too late to happen. <coughs> it should have happened much earlier. It should have been a continuous process, actually over the years. Uh, your third question, is Putin irrational in relation to Russia's state interests? Um, well, here I come back to his personal agenda. Uh, quite often people have got Putin wrong when they have said, surely he won't do that because it's not in Russia's interest to do that. And then he goes ahead and does it. And they say, this guy is completely irrational. He just shot himself in the foot where he shot himself in both feet. How on earth can he do something that does such damage to, for example, the investment prospects? I mean, the Russian economy now desperately needs investment. Capital flight, as you will have read on the front page of Financial Times today, is estimated by the Russian Ministry of Economy to hit $70 billion in the first quarter of this year. 
Well, he hit 65 billion in the whole of last year, and that was a horrific figure. It may exceed 200 billion dollars this year. Uh, the Russian economy now is running at full capacity, but with very low labour productivity, about 30% of the uh, equivalent uh, rate of labour productivity for the United States. It desperately needs uh, investment, modern equipment, to make it work. And Putin has just done something that has killed off prospects of new investment and has got people struggling to take money out of Russia rather than come in. So it's not against Russia's interests. I mean, in no way does it add up to being in Russia's interests. But this isn't the point about Putin. It's entirely rational in terms of his personal agenda. And so much of what he's done uh, over the years that we have looked at as being irrational has been rational if you consider the personal agenda. Uh, I remember when I was a fairly young diplomat uh, being schooled in what uh, Prince Metternich had said at the Congress of Vienna uh, when he was told that the Russian ambassador had died. And the great statesman scratched his head and paused for a minute and then said, I wonder what his motives were. <laughs> and that's the question we have to keep asking. But with Putin, the personal motive. Can I take a couple more? In the front. Uh, about the subject, but I would like to take you on your last point about the West in your opinion having failed to reach a better um, outcome in this whole situation. Uh, my first question would be why you think that, what would have been in your view a better, although you've, you've pointed at it, um, to spur a bit more if possible. And also, do you think that perhaps we may have lost the right to influence um, by then the typical situation of the pot, calling the kettle, the kettle called the pot, whatever, whatever. Um, after our recent interventions, how much influence can we really have in, in decisions such as this? Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. question. Like, basically, tell um, us who you are. Huh? Tell us who you are. Um, I'm Mark from Russia. And I listen to your, uh, the thing that you said basically, but you didn't mention a few things, that in Russia we hear every day. You didn't mention that in 2015, Bruxelles said that Yanukovych was elected democratically. Then you didn't discuss that the European Union and the United States financially supported the new Nazis in order to make the, the call. You didn't mention that Putin brought on the table a trilateral partnership with Ukraine, the Russia, and European Union, where Putin said that we will provide $20 billion for, as an aid. Once Yanukovych has decided to go, to go with Putin, EU decided to support the call. So Yanukovych became like the, the enemy. Uh, Crimea, we can say also that Crimea used its right of self-determination. And George Holloway, uh, a professor of the University of London, said that Ukrainians sell, uh, felt themselves threatened. Uh, that's why they want to be with Russia. Could and also come to a question. Huh? Could you come to no, a no, question? No, no, like I would like to debate. Uh, well, I'm sorry. sorry, you're not giving a lecture tonight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> the yeah, yeah, All right, yeah. give us one more point and then I'll respond. <laughs> and also, you didn't mention the, the NATO geopolitics that are Okay, let's stop there. Um, uh, and also about the sanctions. The sanctions, the last point, yeah. and I finish. I don't think that the sanctions will affect only Russia, but also European Union. Because one of the biggest partners is Germany. And also the CEO of Goldman Sachs is not, is, Goldman Sachs is not very keen to accept sanctions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what you've given, I think, is a very fair reflection of... I mean, I spent the first three days of last week in Moscow talking to hundreds of different people about Ukraine, and, and those are all points that came up. I didn't cover them in my lecture because I spoke for far too long anyway, and if I covered all the other points... But I'll come back to them. Can I come to Maria's point first? Um, why did the West fail? She asked two questions. Why had we failed, and 
uh, had we not lost the right uh, actually to take a high moral stance on this because it's the pot calling the kettle black. Um, I, think, I think there are lots of reasons why we got this wrong. Uh, I wouldn't... I'm a bit wary of beating up too much on the West because I don't think that uh, the mistakes we made justify what Putin has done in any shape or form. But they provide useful excuses for him and good propaganda lines. Uh, and we have made plenty of mistakes, but we're rather more honest about our mistakes, perhaps, and we have a system in which we can debate them and in which our parliaments can vote out governments that make mistakes, none of which is true in Russia. Um, certainly, we have made the argument more difficult for ourselves through some of the things that have been done by the West, the ones that Putin quoted in his speech and the quotes most commonly, of course, is Kosovo, 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 Iraq, Afghanistan. Those are all very different circumstances. Uh, and, of course, he says the West argued that Kosovo was a special case. Well, everything's a special case. Crimea is a special case. The point about Kosovo is, firstly, that Milosevic was actually conducting ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. Nobody was conducting ethnic cleansing in Crimea. There was a real threat to Kosovo. There was no threat to Crimea at all. The population there was essentially living under the protection of the Russians before this happened because of the Russian military base and because you had a large majority of Russians in that population. So there was no equivalent to the justification that the West cited to justify what it did in Kosovo, which was to avert an overwhelming humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, first point. Secondly, Kosovo had been negotiating with Belgrade for eight years over its status. I believe that the status of Crimea could have been resolved and changed peacefully through negotiation because I think the Crimeans had a strong case, or the Russians had a strong case over Crimea. They didn't have to invade. It could have been negotiated, and had they opened a negotiation with Ukraine over the future status of Crimea, I think that we would have supported many of their arguments and that some, there are many possible statuses you could conceive of for Crimea uh, between being part of Russia and part of Ukraine um, and you could have found a negotiated solution to that. Uh, now, Kosovo and Belgrade, uh, in essence, when we did what we did in Kosovo, uh, it was using force as a last resort after eight years of negotiation and to preempt a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, third dis point of difference is that there would have been a United Nations resolution sanctioning what was done on Kosovo were it not for the fact that Russia had the power of veto. So that was the only thing that stopped us actually formalizing it under international law through a UN Security Council resolution. Difference there from Iraq where we tried to get a clear second resolution and didn't get it. Um, final point, uh, proof of the pudding, if you like. Kosovo is now doing quite well. Uh, thanks to Cathy Ashton, an agreement has now been negotiated between Kosovo and Belgrade, which will very likely lead to Serbia joining the European Union. Over 100 countries now recognise Kosovo as an independent state. Six years ago, South Ossetia and Abkhazia were declared, essentially by Moscow, to be independent states. Who can tell me how many countries recognise uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent states? Five. Five? Two. Yeah, I think it's five. <laughs> and what are they, Peter? There's Russia, Russia Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Venezuela... Nauru. Hmm? Nauru. Uh, Nauru. <laughs> yes. OK. Uh, so, in terms of ex post facto legitimation, Kosovo tells one story, they tell another story. So I think there are differences. You have to get into rather a lot of detail. I do not deny that we have damaged some of the unilateral actions of Western countries. Uh, and some would argue Iraq. I am not in a position where I can talk much about Iraq. But there, of course, Europe was divided. Uh, have certainly undermined our argument or made it easy for Putin to say Western double standards, which is, of course, a favourite theme. Um, 
Marx points. Uh, yes, trilateral partnerships were proposed, as we've really, Peter made the same point, by, by Putin and Yanukovych. But that was essentially asking us to sign up on Yanukovych's terms and, 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 and Putin's terms. And there was no way that we were going to do that. It was not an equal partnership. You said the people in Crimea felt threatened. By whom? <coughs> By whom? Hmm? By neo-Nazis. They now have the power. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that nobody was threatening Crimea uh, before the referendum was called and the annexation happened. And when we talk about neo-Nazis, th 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 this is a line of propaganda. You need to recognize when you are being fed a line of propaganda by, by the Kremlin. There are some neo-Nazis in Ukraine. There are at least as many neo-Nazis in Russia. I mean, there have been some very nasty incidents of neo-Nazi behavior. There are neo-Nazis in this country. There are some neo-Nazis in Germany. There are some neo-Nazis in America. But these are very small numbers of people. And I would, I would estimate that the number in Ukraine that you could categorize reasonably as neo-Nazis is, 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 is probably about the same percentage as in Russia. So let us not fall into the idea of thinking, I won't spend too long on this because it is a propaganda line, that the, that the, that the interim Sorry, government... Simply not true. Um, <coughs> your final point that sanctions would would hurt us as well as Russia absolutely true. I mean, one of the ways in which the situation is so different from the Cold War is that in the last twenty years, and this has been a very good development. Uh, Western Europe, to a degree the United States, but Western Europe much more, have become interconnected with Russia in every way, through trade, through personal connections, through the 226,000 Russians who came to this country last year and who are very welcome, Mark, in this country. And when I was serving in Moscow in 1990, we issued 4,500 visas. When I was serving in Moscow in 2004, we issued 100,000. Now 226,000. This is good. This is very good. But it does mean that when we trade more, we invest more than the rest of it. That it's not like Soviet days when if you went into a political freeze, you could cut things very, very easily because everything ran through the channels of the state. Now, there will be pain if we get into deeper sanctions. I mean, already what has happened, which is really uh, economic damage not directly caused by sanctions, it is causing pain. It is causing pain in, in, in Western countries and there will be worse pain. But we can, we can live with it if we have to. We don't want to do it. We don't want to undermine the Russian economy. We don't want to undermine our own economy. You would only do it if you had to. But if Putin sent his troops across the border, I would confidently, but not happily, expect that we will be into deeper sanctions. And that would undo already what has happened. It's undone a lot of the work that I myself have been doing over 25 years. So I don't want it to happen. We have time. Yes, we have yes. time. And let's start at the front with you, and then go back to you and give it back. Yes. Thank you. Um, Tina Goletiani, I'm from Georgia, from Maritime Australia. Um, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, um, the, the, the action of Russia in Crimea, um, to a certain extent, differed the trend in Transnistria and in, in, in Georgia, in, in, in the presence of Russia, in terms of uh, Russia did not stop on recognizing the entity as an independent state, but uh, annex it, putting it as a failure complete. Um, do you think that this, and by this actually re re rewriting the whole um, rules of international relations slash international law, which is the self-determination and cessation, um, what would be your assessment? Because there could be different assessments whether the, this fate accompli actually in long term will be detrimental to Russia or whether by this Russian government uh, once again crossed the red line, red line that goes beyond the geopolitics but of, of, of uh, post-Soviet Union space but enters into a world politics of uh, which is th even the theory of, of, of international relations and international law. And my second question is that, um, and I think I, I absolutely agree with you in terms of that 
the Bucharest summit was a, a, a big fail in terms um, both for the for West as well as for the um, post-Soviet Union, former Soviet Union um, states. Uh, EU and the United States were pushing, for instance, both Georgia and Ukraine, both into the close cooperation with the EU as well as uh, raising the hopes for the member <coughs> of, of, of uh, NATO. However, unfortunately, this was not the case due to the different political positions of the EU and, uh, and US. But at the same time, do we see the same situation now? Because if we see the actions of EU following the Crimea crisis, is that um, the um, <coughs> EU very um, directly notes that in each and every statement that the association agreement will be um, signed in the nearest future, both with Georgia um, and with Ukraine, the part of the whole agreement. So is this also the gambling at the same, uh, from one hand, showing um, Russia the determination that EU is still supporting the Western route for these countries. But at the same time, is the EU ready, and the US is ready to support those countries till the end? Because we could have a same situation as we had back in 2008. Thank you. Thank you. There are a lot of people who want to ask questions, so can we keep questions short, please? Yes. Um, my name is Pat, I'm a writer, I'm from the United States, and last week I found them for the three hours debating the Ukraine. Mr. Haig was there, and so I went and listened to it. And then uh, the rhetoric was really high, uh, the emotion was really high. I mean, people, uh, the MPs used words like pathetic, and, and Mr. Haig using words like illegitimate, illegal, and then, but then they talk about he has to be able to say one voice. And then the energy that our Russian friend mentioned in Germany are really dependent on, I think, one third of the energy sources from Russia. So, and then they're talking about they should work with America, but they, they don't, they are not buying it to. And then, so I'm just wondering if you cited the lack of political will, um, because uh, and then after three hours debate, you mentioned 21 people being on the list. And then just very, very, uh, the, the whole sense is like there's just almost nothing you can do. And if it, in fact, you mentioned like uh, Putin has his personal agenda, he doesn't really care, and he knew it's gonna uh, impact Russian economy, but he wasn't gonna do it anyway. And then we will be, of course, the whole EU and America as well, will be affected by the sanction too. And then um, the military response has been ruled out by both EU and America. So I just don't know if there's anything we can in fact do, and then if we, um, he hasn't been emboldened that he will do even more. I'll put you down as an optimist. Uh, there was one more back there. Yes. Short one, please. Yes. Uh, I'm Ewan from SPP. Uh, I want to ask a question because uh, Russia is currently seeking uh, support from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So I was wondering if do you think it is possible for China to recognize uh, Crimea as a part of Russia, or will it just keep its neutral position at the US Security Council? Thank you. OK, um, very good questions. Um, <clears throat> some people asking multiple questions. Um, first question, uh, Crimea, what has happened there is different from South Ossetia and um, Transnistria in that the Russians have gone for straight annexation. Uh, will that be detrimental to Russia in the long term? Well, they've created some very dangerous precedents here because they've been resisting secessionism in places like Chechnya, <coughs> at an earlier stage, Tatarstan, and now they've created three examples or four examples. They haven't really legitimized Transdenistria uh, for secessionism. And I think over the long term, uh, Chechens are going to say source for the goose is source for the gander. I mean, I sometimes wonder in this point uh, when the Japanese are going to pop up and say, what about our islands? And uh, should we march in there and take them back? Because that was part of the post-war settlement that Japan has never accepted. Uh, and they have been negotiating for a long time. 
So I think over the long term, yeah, Russia has created a rod for its own back. Um, and it certainly, with regard to the effect on international law, it is quite clear they are manifestly in breach of international law. And their argument, Putin's arguments on this are very weak. I mean, he said, the Crimean people had the right of self-determination. And then he quoted the United Nations on that. Uh, but the right of self-determination does not mean uh, automatically the right to, to secede from the state you're in. Uh, and so that doesn't actually carry the day for him as an argument. Otherwise, his main argument was, well, you guys have done it, so we can do it, so that's all right. And sort of this tendency to tear up the rule book when it doesn't suit him. Uh, on the Bucharest summit and the question of whether the EU association agreement offer with Georgia risks making the same mistake. Um, I think it doesn't because firstly I don't think Georgia matters to Russia in the way that Ukraine does. I think that Russia now has the sort of relationship with Georgia that it's reasonably comfortable with. The new leadership in Georgia is not Saakashvili. Saakashvili was constantly needling the Russians. He was arresting Russian spies. He was calling Putin Lily Putin, which Putin didn't like at all. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, uh, so the, it was a bit, it got very personal with Saakashvili. But also, uh, you know, now with the Russian troops occupying parts of Georgia, uh, Georgia's no threat to Russia. They don't really, I think they accept that Georgia is on a westernizing course economically and so on, as long as it doesn't become part of NATO. That's the red line, I think. Uh, I hope I'm not proved wrong by them marching back into Georgia next week. Um, the question of uh, the West speaking with one voice and are the Germans so beholden to Russian energy supplies that they can't do anything and all we can do is a list of 21 and so on. Well, yeah, maintaining unity in the European Union on this is extremely difficult. I think probably the most frustrating parts of my official career were sitting in EU meetings that went on for hours and hours and hours and ended up with the sort of lowest common denominator on any subject. It is very, very difficult. And some countries in the European Union are extremely weak on this. The most significant and important country with regard to Russia, as on most issues in the European Union, is Germany. And I think one of the really significant things in this crisis is that at last, I mean, Angela Merkel has always had I think a very good and realistic um, appreciation of Russia. She, of course, grew up in East Germany. She speaks Russian. She can talk to Putin in Russian or in English. And I don't think she has any illusions at all. She's vastly better than her predecessor, the dreadful Chancellor Schroeder, who ended up on the payroll of Gazprom, which is absolutely scandalous. Uh, so I think she's always been good. But she has had difficulty with coalition partners and with the hugely powerful German business lobby who were very critical of her after she took a strong stand over Georgia. Now, there are signs, I haven't been in Germany since this crisis erupted, that actually the central gravity of German opinion is shifting. Very interesting article by the chairman of the Bundestag Foreign Affairs Committee in the Financial Times last Friday, a man called Rotgen, um, and he's now speaking up in the Bundestag on this, uh, actually arguing for a tough line and saying they cannot be uh, they can't allow the commercial considerations to determine Germany's position on this. Merkel, in the Bundestag, on the Friday before the Ukrainian referendum, talked of Russia's actions and the upcoming referendum and annexation as being threatening to Germany. That's a really strong term to use. And so I think Germany is shifting. I think it will continue to be difficult to hold together the EU and the EU and the United States in an appropriately firm response. I was surprised pleasantly by how united and firm the EU was on the 6th of March. I think last Thursday it struggled a lot and there were some in the EU who wanted to go running off to Moscow to negotiate, which is why as soon as I heard that I sat down and wrote a piece which Chatham House have now put out uh, saying why this would be a dreadful mistake. But I'm told that certain people had to be physically restrained from running off to Moscow and saying, please, Mr. Putin, can we settle on your terms? Because it wouldn't be on any other terms. As for a military response, no, we're not going to fight a nuclear war. 
uh, and everybody knows that. So saying we're not going to do it uh, uh, doesn't remove an element of doubt. The red lines are around NATO, not Ukraine. Finally, very important question about China's attitude. And again, like Germany, this is a really interesting one. The fact that the Chinese abstained in the Security Council when 13 countries voted against Russia was not insignificant. I think China is sitting there saying, we don't have to take a strong stand on this. We're certainly not going to approve what Russia has done because the implications for international order and for ourselves are not ones that we can approve. Important point of principle, China doesn't want to sanction this. But at the same time, there are lots of potential benefits for us in this because Russia may come running to us for help and then we can find all sorts of commercial advantage. We can do business on much tougher terms than the West would do. Uh, why should the Chinese... They don't have to please the West. They don't have to please Russia. So they can sit back, watch it develop, uh, take their time and wait for advantages to flow to them. And almost certainly it plays into their geopolitical advantage. So as always, I think they're being very smart. Time for one more round, and uh, I'm looking first at this side of the room because all the questions have come from this side. <laughs> Anyone on this side want to ask a question? Okay. Yes, okay. So let's just see how many. You've got people. one at the back, one, one at the front, and, and one on the left. Four in this round. Four quick questions starting with. Right, no multi headers allowed. <laughs> right. Or speeches. Yep. Um, because, as you said, Putin, he dig the hole himself, basically, and Russia now is stuck economically. Is it actually beneficial for the West not to help Ukraine in Crimea because it's affecting Russia? Does it have any link? Uh, Don't completely understand the point. Is it beneficial for the West not to help? You know, it's because, like, U Europe is not really helping. Uh, Over Crimea? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, and the Russian economy is going down. Yeah. You know, in Europe it doesn't do anything. And I just yeah, it, yeah. You know, okay. Is there any link? And also, do you think uh, like a cold war, has it ever finished? Like, oh, there was just slightly sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, to back. Yes. Uh, ignoring legality, how would you assess the referendum itself? Thank you. That was a good, quick question. That's, that's all I was going to ask. Is how did you think the referendum result was? Great. Yes. Uh, with regards to the revolution, coup, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's kind of difficult, though, do you not think, to resist the impression that um, the EU did back how unpopular it might have been, what would undoubtedly be unconstitutional transfer of power in Ukraine when Yukonovich was removed from power. And so when we talk about the referendum being a violation of the Ukrainian constitution, there's a bit of hypocrisy there. And just as a broader question, do you not think, I mean, consensus aside, in the long run, is it viable for three countries like Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, which are so thoroughly socially, culturally, and economically linked, to coexist as independent and separate countries? Um, right. Uh, why didn't Why didn't we make a stronger stand over Crimea? Um, we weren't going to fight over Crimea. Uh, basically, I suppose, because Russia has a case over Crimea. They've gone about it the wrong way, but they had a case over Crimea. And it was right to take a strong stand against this breach of international law. But given that the greater threat, that what has, what has happened in Crimea <clears throat> is not a great victory for Mr. Putin, because he has strategic control of Crimea already. He had the naval base, he had the population. Uh, therefore, a distinction was drawn between Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. Uh, and the tripwire, if you like, for really serious action was erected there. I think it was felt that probably what was happening in Crimea was unstoppable, but that there was a possibility of deterring deeper incursion into Ukraine. I think all of those factors will have come into the mix.
Um, has the Cold War finished, or is it, was it just asleep? Um, both, is the answer. Yes, it really did finish, and however badly this may turn out, even in the worst case scenario, it won't be the Cold War again. Why won't it be the Cold War? Because the Warsaw Pact is gone. Because Russia is a much smaller state, even with Crimea added. Uh, because the Russian military, while still powerful, still with huge numbers of nuclear weapons, is a lot less powerful than the Soviet military was. Because Russia could only sustain the Cold War against a much more powerful, much richer United States by diverting almost all of its economy into the military industrial area. Not only huge numbers of people in uniform, and they now have a much smaller army, it's still I think about a million, I'm not an expert on this, but it's come down massively from where it was. But almost all production and scientific research, I mean, you know, had we been in Russia and Cold War days, three quarters of you would have been working on issues funded by and relating to the defense industry. You might have been doing alloys for rockets or whatever it was. Or you might be training for medicine for, for the army. Um, which is why the consumer in Russia, in the Soviet Union, was so poorly fed, so poorly clothed, so poorly housed. All the resources were going that way. There is no way, conceivably, that Mr. Putin could reorient the Russian economy into, in, into a state of fighting a Cold War again. The people simply wouldn't stand it. They're enjoying the fact their living standards have gone up and they're much higher than they were 20 years ago. Um, uh, so, and, and then there are, as I said, all these interconnections. So we can get into a very frosty period, but I do not think we're going to be, under any scenario I can see, back into a Cold War in which we are threatening each other, East and West, with mutually assured distraction. Uh, that's the slightly good news. Um, how do I assess the Crimean referendum? Um, well, obviously, I wasn't there watching the votes being counted, but, you know, from any range, you can see that this was totally bogus. It was totally bogus because only one side campaigned. Uh, it was totally bogus because of the way the questions on the paper was framed. It was totally bogus because more votes were counted than there were people on electoral rolls or even populations of the districts in which they were counted. Um, uh, it was totally bogus because the minorities essentially just refrained from voting because they knew it was going to be totally bogus. It was set up at short notice without any legitimacy. Uh, so um, really it wasn't the world's greatest ever referendum. They'll do a lot better in Scotland. Um, <laughs> I'm not forecasting the result. Would the result have been different had there been a real referendum in Crimea over that? Uh, we don't know, is the answer. I mean, uh, past opinion polls suggested that maybe 40-42% of the Crimean population would have voted for annexation of Russia, slightly uh, smaller number the other way, and the rest undecided. So we simply don't know, but it wouldn't have been 96%. Um, and finally, the problem of the unconstitutional coup against Mr. Yanukovych. Uh, yeah, this is one of the weak points in the Western argument, that on the 21st of February, the EU underwrote, in the presence also of a Russian witness, Mr. Lukin, an agreement between Yanukovych and three opposition leaders under which they were going to hold elections in December. Yanukovych would remain in power until then, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then the following day, as a result of this agreement being rejected by the Maidan, uh, then the Rada uh, swings the other way, and some of Yanukovych's own deputies in the party of the regions simply get the hell out of the building because they don't want to be there. But a majority in the Rada, indeed a unanimous vote in the Rada, 326 to zero or something, I may have got the figure marginally wrong, but of that order, uh, voted Yanukovych out of power, and then he flees. Um, so, uh, how unconstitutional is it if your parliament adopts by a unanimous vote uh, a vote uh, that the Prime Minister, or the President in this case, is out of office? Uh, it's a bit messy. And one argument being put very strongly in Moscow and that was put to me endlessly last week was that you, the EU, underwrote this agreement 
And when it was torn up the next day, with the Parliament acting under pressure from the Maidan, you said nothing. You did not criticise that, so you acquiesced in that happening. These things happened very fast, and clearly Yanukovych was on his way out. To me, the most important thing in all of that story is that most of Yanukovych's own deputies in his own party of the regions were no longer prepared to stand by him, uh, and, and they actually left. But sure, it's, it's, it was messy, and uh, if we r ran the tape again, uh, then uh, maybe we should have stepped in at that point and said, well, hang on, we signed up to an agreement, or rather we underwrote an agreement, uh, we better review this. I don't know. Not the strongest point in our argument. Um, have I covered it all? Did you have one second question? Well, in the long term, whether or not it's viable for Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, being so integrated with one another to, I mean, if you leave consent to sign in, they probably don't want to, but to in strategic terms, don't consent to sign in, they probably don't want to. Um, yeah. And rather than to be all one country. Yeah. I never really felt that the independence of Belarus made much sense. Um, uh, in the, there was a real independence movement in Ukraine in the late 1980s, and I think the Ukrainian referendum, as I said, of uh, December 1991 was probably a fairly honest reflection of what happened. Uh, but Belarus has even less uh, of a history than Ukraine, much less of a history uh, of Ukraine, uh, as an identifiable state um, and has less of a national identity. I hope I'm not causing grave offence to any Belarusians in this room. Uh, and I think the case is much weaker. It became independent by accident. They woke up one day and found that because of the way that Yeltsin was manoeuvring to get rid of Gorbachev and the Ukrainians were manoeuvring by independence, de facto they woke up one morning and found they were an independent state, which they had never expected or intended. Um, and they didn't have the sense of nationality of Georgia or Armenia or Azerbaijan uh, and so on. Were the people of Belarus, now who've got used to 20 years of independence, to vote in a genuinely democratic, fair, free, internationally observed referendum to rejoin Russia, uh, I would see no reason at all why we should seek to oppose that, we in the West. I suspect they wouldn't, because first of all, you get used to the idea of being ruled by your own people. But secondly, and most importantly, if they look eastwards and they say, how's Russia doing? Is that a great model for us? Do we want to be part of that? And you'd be poor relations. In Belarus and Ukraine, one of the disadvantages of being ruled from Moscow is you're second-class citizens, actually. Uh, or, look the other way, how's Poland doing? Fantastic. Hey, we'll have that one, please. Uh, so, and it's perfectly viable for them to exist as separate states. I mean, Benelux exists as three separate states. I mean, you can drive from one to the other, but you can think of a lot of examples of fairly similar countries that sit side by side as independent states because that's what history has left them being. I, I don't see a fundamental objection to that. And you put them all together again, and you've got a rather large area that, I mean, Moscow is struggling to run Russia because it's such a big area. And the bigger it is, the worse it will be run. So at that point, I'll stop. <laughs>